Right, um, we've covered the six basic latches and flip-flops you need to know. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at how to make them. How do you construct one of these using the normal logic gates that we know up to now? AND, OR, NOR, XOR, whichever the logic gate is that you want to consider. So the first element that we had was the basic SR latch. And we said that works in the following way. It works in the way that if reset is 1, Q will be 0. And if set is 1, Q will be 1. And if they're both 0, then Q will just maintain its value. So let's have a quick look at the circuit here, which really performs that function. What you can do for the circuit is you can write down the logic um, function, just a normal Boolean algebra lot function to describe this logic. And I'll do that on the paper while it's on the slide, and then I'll show you as well. So what you can see is Q is equal to the NOR of reset and this intermediate thing here. Let's call that intermediate thing just B. So Q is equal to the inverse of the OR of B and reset. I'll show you quickly what I mean. Q is equal to the inverse of B and reset. What we can then also say is, but B is equal to the NOR of set and Q, something like this. B is equal to not Q, Q. So if you rewrite this whole thing out, you can say Q, just going to put in next here so we don't get confused. Q next is equal to the inverse of, just replace B in there, S plus Q plus R. And this Q here, I'm just going to make Q previous. So, if you consider this for a second, um, let's just evaluate this quickly. If reset is equal to 1, what will happen? If reset is equal to 1, then Q next is equal to the inverse of 1 or with something. Now, 1 or something doesn't really matter, it's 1. 1 or anything is equal to 1, so the inverse of it is 0. So good, reset actually reset our circuit. Let's consider S is equal to 1. So if S is equal to 1 and reset is equal to 0, I'm just going to put that here, because we already did reset is equal to 1, then Q next is equal to set is equal to 1, Reset is equal to zero, so it's the inverse of zero or something. Zero or something is just that something. So it's the inverse of the inverse of S plus Q previous. The inverse of the inverse of S, which is one, or Q previous. So if you look at that, one plus anything, one or anything is just one. So it's the inverse of the inverse of one, which is equal to uh, which is equal to one. So set has in fact set our circuit, but reset had an over read, over uh, overriding function there. Then, if R is equal to zero and S is equal to zero, which is the only remaining combination that we need to concern ourselves with, is uh, let's just quickly consider that Q next is equal to the inverse of the inverse of now set is equal to zero plus q prev plus reset which is also equal to zero that gives you the inverse of the inverse of q previous which is just equal to q previous so what you can see is q is just equal to q when reset and set are zero so i'll expect you to be able to analyze the circuit as I've done here uh, in the semester test and the exam as well. So that's how we simply and easily make an SR latch using NOR gates. So with your knowledge of NAND gates, you should be able to... Well, let me, I'll get, that, gotta get onto that in a second. Um, if you just shift this a bit, so you just take the two OR gates and put them on top of each other, you end up with this circuit here, which is the more common way of representing it. Um, and this is really 
if, if you if you look in any data sheet or so, it'll indicate this circuit, not really the, the one that we've seen at the top there. Anyway, the only thing that I want to add here is you can see there's a condition here, set is equal to 1 and reset is equal to 1. And that we didn't really cover in our analysis. So if reset is equal to 1 and set is equal to 1, then you just have this condition here again. So whenever reset is 1, we have this condition. That's what we calculated. So the output is 0. So that gives us a bit of a problematic situation. If set and reset is equal to 1, you don't want that condition to occur, first of all. But then QA is equal to 0. And what you can see here is that intermediate signal we had, B, that B, which is called QB here, is really the not Q that we have in the uh, latches diagram. So I'm just going to jump back if you allow me. That there is not Q. And QB performs that function of not Q except when set and reset are both 1. Then it doesn't work. Then it doesn't behave properly. Otherwise, QB is just the inverse of Q. And you can go and calculate that. Okay, uh, then the gated SR latch, and we, we explained that this gated SR latch just means it behaves like an SR latch if the gate is open, so if clock is equal to 1. However, if clock is equal to 0, it doesn't matter what S and R are, value are, values are, it just ignores it and it maintains the value of Q. So if clock is 0, it ignores the inputs. If clock is 1, it behaves like an SR latch. That's the bottom four one there. If the S and R are 0 and clock is 1, QT will not change. It will remember its value. So let's, let's just look at how to make one of those. If you make one of these, all that happens is we abuse this property of AND gates that it acts like a gate. You'll recall from it was multiplexers. In a multiplexer, we used more or less the same idea to either allow a signal to go through or not to go through. So if clock is 0, then neither R nor S will be allowed to go through the AND gate. Whether it's 0 or 1 doesn't matter. If clock is 0, then this will be 0. If clock is 1, then this will be equal to R, and this will be equal to S. And so this is how we implement this gate property of it. So you can see this is an SR latch, and this here is just the gate implementation. And here's the truth table for it. So it's a fairly simple implementation. And, and typically, when you see this in the real world, you will see it as NAND gates. So you can easily configure this into NAND gates using some of the theory you know already. And this is exactly the same implementation as our gated SR latch. Just now it's done with NAND gates. Here it was done with NOR gates and AND gates. Um, then the next one we have is a gated D latch. And we said the gated D latch, instead of having two inputs, it only has one. And it's level sensitive, so while clock is equal to 1, Q will reflect D. That word while is important to understand here. While clock is 1, Q is equal to D. Not when or the event of clock changing while clock is 1. It's level sensitive. And the way that that's done is just to take that gated SR latch and make the inputs into 1. So instead of having S and R, we just take a one input D, which takes D into S and inverts it into R. So now suddenly S and R are inverses of each other, which means we, we avoid that horrible condition. Here we go. Well, not horrible, but bad condition when S and R are both one. This here cannot occur if you invert one of the inputs and put it into R. So S and R will always be inverses. And what we have here is this D, uh, D latch which is essentially a memory element. If D is equal to 1 and clock is equal to 1, then Q will just reflect D. And if clock is equal to 0, Q will just maintain its value. It's one bit of memory, um, which is activated by clock being equal to 1, so a level of 1. OK. And then the next one I want to show you now, and this is really important, this is where it gets a bit more difficult, is the edge-triggered flip-flop. So the edge-triggered flip-flop, how to make one of those, um, the simplest way to do it is to use two level-sensitive latches. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, Afrikaans for flip-flop is a grendel, 
and Afrikaans for a latch. No, it's the other way, sorry. Afrikaans for a latch is a grendel, and Afrikaans for a flip-flop is a wipkrang. Wipkrang. All right, so what you see here is, is an implementation of a, a negative edge-triggered flip-flop using two gated D latches. And I just want to talk you through it because it's quite important to understand it. I'm just going to go to the next slide to show you. What happens is this flip-flop here, which is called the master, sorry, this latch here, which is called the master, this is activated when clock is one. This, this latch here, which is called the slave, is activated while clock is equal to zero. You can see there's an inversion here. So when this input is zero, then this will be one. So the input here into this clock will be one, which will activate this latch. So in total, what happens here is QM will follow D. I say follow D because it's level sensitive here. So while clock is one, QM will look like D. As soon as clock goes to zero, suddenly this thing will switch off and this thing will switch on. And when switch on, I mean activate. So suddenly then QAs will follow QM. So because this is level sensitive on a positive clock level, this is level sensitive on a negative clock level, what will happen is the combination of the two is edge sensitive, the transition sensitive from going from a positive clock to a negative clock. So in total, these two in combination will say, um, I'm waiting for a falling edge and then I'm sampling D. And let me just explain that again. So QM will look exactly like D while clock is one. And then when clock goes to zero, QS will take that value of QM and keep it there while clock is equal to zero. Oh, sorry, while clock is equal to zero, yes, zero. And while clock is zero, obviously QM will be unaffected by D. So in combination, these two perform an edge sensitive function. Let's just look at this quickly. I just want to get, oh, I can't. Um, just want to talk you through this block diagram or this timing diagram quickly. So just considering QM real quick, QM says, I will look like D while clock is equal to 1. So QM, initially, this is drawn as a 0, but actually we have no clue. We have no clue what the value of QM is until we have clock is equal to 1. So this should have been X is, X is, X is up to a point where clock is 1. While clock is 1, QM looks like D. Then clock goes to 0, and suddenly QM just keeps its value. So regardless of D changing, because clock is zero, QM keeps its value. It waits until clock is one again. And while clock is one, it takes the value of D. So D is zero, it keeps its value zero. Until clock is equal to zero, then QM just keeps its own value. Regardless of what D does, you can see D goes up here. Regardless of what it does, QM stays low. Then when the clock goes to one again, and while it's one as well, it follows D. So it says, I need to follow D, jumps to one, and it follows D boop, 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 up to this point, and then it just follows itself again because the clock is zero. So that's QM. QS says the following. QS says, I want to follow QM when this signal here is one. So I want to follow QM while the input here is zero. You'll see that's an inverse of clock, right? So while clock is zero, so exactly the same as what we've done for QM, we now do for QS except on zero clocks. So initially clock is zero, so that's good. So Q will just reflect, um, sorry, QS will just reflect QM. Now remember what I said, actually we don't know what QM's value is here. It should have been X's, X's, X's up to this point here. So I guess this QS should have been X's as well up to this point here. Yeah, I'll get back to that later. Um, so what happens then is we have clock is equal to zero clock is equal to 1, and only when clock is 0 again does, uh, let me just start again, so while clock is 0, QS follows QM. So when clock goes to 1, QS just retains its value, just keeps its value. When clock goes to 1 again, uh, sorry, to 0 again, QS takes the value of QM, which is 1 in this case, and it keeps it there, it keeps following QM until clock goes to 1. So when clock goes to 1, 
QS just keeps its value. It just keeps its value, keeps its value, keeps its value until clock is equal to 0. And when clock is equal to 0 again, it'll follow QM. And QM is 0 here, so it'll follow 0, 0, 0, 0. You see, um, at this point, clock goes to 1. So even though QM goes to 1, clock is 1 as well, so QS just ignores QM. Ignores it, keeps its value, keeps its value, and then clock goes to zero again. So at that point, QM starts to follow QS again. Ah, QS starts to follow QM again, which is one here. And that's why I have that. Now, if you could just consider the whole circuit quickly and pretend that you see a uh, an edge sensitive flip flop, and then what you will expect to see is when you have a falling edge on clock, that this whole thing. If you consider it as one unit, as a black box, that whole thing should sample D and put it onto Q. So when you have a falling edge, it samples D, which is 1, puts it onto Q, and it keeps its value. When you have the next falling edge, it samples D, which is 0, puts it onto Q. There we go. When there's a falling edge again, it samples D, puts it onto Q, and it stays 1. The important thing that I've not mentioned, and I think it's quite important to understand, is that, well, I believe it's quite important to understand, is that, in fact, we have no idea what QS would be up to this point. It's only at this point here, when we have the falling edge, that we know QS will look like D. Up to this point, we don't know what QM is. Up to the first rising edge of clock, and up to the first falling edge of clock, we don't know what... QS is. Um, okay, and this is just the truth table to indicate how these two look as well. The, just note that this is a bit different to the one on the first slide. Now the clock edge is waiting for a falling edge, not a rising edge. And this is a timing diagram. And this timing diagram is really the way for you to test whether you know what's going on. So what you will see is at the top here we have a D latch. Then we have a positive edge triggered D flip flop, and then we have a negative edge triggered D flip flop. So let's let's quickly look at that as well. Your clock is the thing that drives this circuit, and then D is the input to it. So the top one here, QA, is dependent on clock being one. So while clock is zero, we don't know what QA would be. The authors of the textbooks decided to make it zero. In fact, you have no idea. You need to make those x's. X, x, x. We don't know what the value of QA would be until we have a clock of e equal to 1. All right, so while clock is equal to 1, QA will follow D. So here you can see uh, D changes and QA follows that D. As soon as clock goes to zero, then this whole thing here ignores D because that gate is closed now. Clock is zero, and regardless of D's shenanigans, QA just stays zero. It remains what it was. Then clock goes to one, and while clock is equal to one, QA follows D. So you can see here in this section where clock is equal to one, QA looks like a copy and paste job of D. In this section here, QA looks like a copy and paste of D. And then while clock is equal to zero, QA just remains whatever it was beforehand. The other two, let's just consider this one quickly. QB says, I'm waiting for a clock edge. Look at the triangle there. I'm waiting for a clock edge. And when there's a clock edge, a rising edge, then I'll sample D and I'll put it onto Q. So when there's a clock edge, which is there, it samples D, it's equal to 1, and it puts it onto QB. Note, before this point, we had no idea what QB would be. It was whatever it was. So really, these here, this section here, this first part, should have been x, 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 x. We have no idea what it was. Okay, anyway, it keeps its value until we have another clock edge, rising clock edge. It ignores the falling edge. Until we have another rising clock edge, at that clock edge, samples D, which is a zero, and it makes QB equal to zero as well. And it keeps that value. This here, negative edge triggered. So it waits for the first negative edge. So we don't know what the value of QC would be until we have the first falling edge. So up to this point, QC should have been x, 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 because we have no idea. Just want to show you how I draw that. So 
to indicate that you don't know, let's say this is our one value and this is zero. So instead of the textbook doing that, the textbook should really have done that. And you'll see this in data sheets. And this in a data sheet means we don't know. Either we don't know or we don't care. All right, so up to when we have the first falling edge of clock, we have no idea what the output of that falling edge sensitive flip-flop would be. So up to that point, I would expect you to draw X's. That's really the right way to do it. So when we have this falling edge, it samples D. It's a zero, so it makes it zero. Ah, it's already zero. So actually, just quickly fix this so that I'm sure you're not confused. So immediately following the falling edge, the value is actually zero, not one. Immediately following that falling edge, it samples D. The value of D is zero, so it keeps it zero. And then at the next falling edge, it samples D again. The value of D is 1, so it makes it 1 and keeps it 1. Okay, so that's it for flip-flops.